Hi, I'm Dylan Gilbertson, creator and writer of various comics such as Sweetheart, Mandible, and My Neighbor Necromancer, now on Kickstarter. You can find me at Dill Gilbertson on most social media sites, including Twitter, Instagram, and Hive. You can see most of my work at DylanDoesComics.com, and you're watching and listening to Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented creator. He's a comic writer and an award-winning comic writer at that as well, too. He has an amazing team, which we'll talk about for his brand new Kickstarter campaign, which is currently ongoing with a really interesting concept and beautiful artwork and design. Joined by the ever talented Dylan Gilbertson. How are you doing today? Hey, I'm doing great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm I'm very excited. I'm a, I'm a fan of the show, and oh. so I'm I'm excited to be here. Well, th- I appreciate you being a fan first off. And, yeah, and I'm a fan of your work too. I I loved this amazing comic, at least from what I've gotten to see so far here too. My Thank neighbor you. necromancer, and that that's amazing. So, for those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. My name is Dylan Gilbertson. I am a comic writer. I'm currently living in Boston. I've written uh, a number of comics at this point. I, most people know me for my book Sweetheart, um, that came out in March of 2020. That one was originally a Kickstarter. It was pretty successful. And then it sort of took on a life of its own. And then uh, I'm coming to you now with a Kickstarter for uh, our book, My Neighbor Necromancer. That's awesome. I saw the campaign. It's doing well so far. You know, I'm glad that you, you're kickstarting another amazing book here as well, too. You have an amazing team for what I got to see as well in the campaign. Who is this team that's around you and, and how did you find them? So Luca Romano is our colorist, and he was actually one of the first creators, I think legitimately one of the, the, probably the first friend that I made in comics. Um, I found him on DeviantArt back when I had no idea what I was doing, making comics, and uh, a friend of mine was drawing a a book we were doing. It didn't really get many legs at the time, but, but Luca, he was so cool, and we became... Uh, very close friends and he knows more about color theory and what works and what doesn't work and and just how to make a page really stand out more than I know about most things. He's always sort of schooling me on why something works and why it doesn't work. He's such a phenomenal guy and a phenomenal colorist. I've been trying to get him on a book uh, for a long time now since then and I'm glad that it was finally this one. The artist is Jason Piperberg. I met him through a comic anthology that I was included on called uh, Yule. It's Dreadful Tales for the Holiday Season. Uh, that was nominated for a Ringo um, in the most recent year. Not not this year, but the previous year was nominated for a Ringo. A lot of us got into a group Twitter DM chat, and we've all become very close friends. And then when I, I sort of started taking this story a little more seriously and started I'm writing out because it, it had been in my notes pad for years at this point. And I was like, I need to get this thing made. And so I wrote it out and uh, asked Jason if he would want to be a part of it. He said, yes, I would love to. And Jason is one of those artists that if he's not working on a big two book or image or or something, something massive in the next couple years, like I'm going to, I'm going to be personally offended for him. Like, He's so good, and it's a crime that he's not a household name already. And so the fact that he's working with me on this book, uh, I I couldn't be more thrilled about it. So it's safe to say that this will be his springboard to the big two and all that other stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) This will be the one that does it for sure. What was the first piece of artwork you got back from your amazing artist that was way better than what you had on the page in script format? That's a great question. I don't know if it's a cheat answer, but the concept art initially when we first started working on it, because I think he did, before we really got anywhere, he did concept art for the characters. And the second that I saw them, I couldn't believe what I was looking at because it looked so good. I don't know. It was like being in a weird dream state where like you'd imagine something for so many years 
And then the thing that's in front of you is actually better than you could have imagined it. In a way, the concept art for all the characters is that. I suppose to not cheat with my answer, I guess, is the scene where... Uh, Jesse runs so the book kind of starts with Jesse running into the forest she's chasing after her pet lizard Bibbits who's who's her best friend in the whole world and so she's chasing and chasing and going in there and then she she stumbles and she trips on this pile of bones and the leaves and then she stands up and there's this big there's this big ah moment and she sees the the dilapidated cabin that that Cyrano who's the good necromancer who who he's been he's been living there for hundreds of years and the cabin it looks straight out of a photograph like it looks so good like you, you've seen it, right? Yeah, it's beautiful. It's a, it's incredible. And I saw that and I couldn't, I literally couldn't believe what I was looking at. It was so, it was awesome. It was great. You know, Kickstarter campaigns are like a second and third job. You've run them yourself as well too. You're aware of, of the struggles that go into it here. But what are some of the tiers that you're putting together for this amazing comic series that people should be picking up if they haven't already that you haven't done in say past campaigns? So one of the things, I don't know why I didn't include them in previous campaigns, but we've got uh, a three pack of stickers that's mm-hmm. in one of the lower tiers. And like stickers are, stickers are great because um, they, they're, they're a lower tier, but they're awesome because you can get a ton of them and you can stick them all over the place. Um, and these ones are like, they're cute, the, the cute little pets of all the, of all the necromancers. And so um, those ones are a lot of fun. Uh, we, we're also doing a custom embroidered beanie. And so in one of the panels in the book, um, Cyrano uses this spell. And the way we illustrate that is we've got a voice balloon and a, a word balloon that uses the skull paw logo. And so it's a cracked skull that's actually in kind of in the shape of a bear claw. We've worked with this custom embroidery shop um, called And So It Begins. Uh, I met her at Wicked Con and she's the nicest person in the world. And I'm so happy to be working with her. Um, and she's going to be making beanies with that logo on the front of it. And it looks so cool. I would buy a ton. Of, I would buy a ton of those for myself just to give them out. And so we've got those going. We've got a variant cover. I don't believe I've ever done a variant cover on a Kickstarter before. We had one for Sweetheart, but that came after the Kickstarter. And the guy doing that, his name is JJ Lopez. Um, if you're familiar, he just got his DC Comics debut. And it was right after... Um, I had talked to him about doing this and he, and he wanted to do it. And then he got his DC comics debut. And I was like, that's incredible, dude. I, I, and he, de- he's more deserving than, than a lot of people. And he just, I felt so thankful that he was willing to, to work with us on this. Cause he's, he's such an incredible artist. Laura Helsby is a UK artist and they've been on my bucket list of artists to work on or work with for, for quite a while. And so when I when I asked them to be on the book to do a print, they not only said yes, but they were extremely excited to be on it. And I couldn't believe that something that I had written and, and proposed to them was met with that kind of excitement from them. And so we workshopped a little bit and the print that they came up with was the necromancer villain in the book. Her name is Rackus, and she's got this staff that has a skull with ram horns growing out of the eyes. And when I wrote that into the description for Rackus, I had always kind of wondered myself, like, where did that skull come from? Like, what would what did it look like when Rackus found the skull or how did she acquire it? And so Laura and I worked on a little bit of a backstory for it together. And so not only create an amazing piece to sort of fit that staff, they helped me come up with a little bit more story for it. And so Laura is almost a co-collaborator at this point. We have an amazing print. We have amazing variants. We have great beanies. We have stickers. It's it, We got a whole mess of madness in there. It's a lot of fun. What's the most misunderstood aspect about the YA genre that people who don't follow it misunderstand? That it's not all Hunger Games and Maze Runners. It's not all angsty teens pining after each other. YA is... It's such a broader category than I think anybody gives it credit for. You can do anything in it. All it really is, is just a a set of loose restraints that means it needs to be appropriate for someone that's under 17, basically, is is really all it is. And you just have to speak to the problems and and the concerns and the lives of people within that age range. It can be literally anything. And so I, I think when people hear YA, they, they kind of think like, oh, I've seen, I've seen Hunger Games, I've seen The Maze Runner, and it's not really my bag. I was like, well, then 
you don't understand the the genre if you want to call it that chances are things that you already love can be held underneath the YA umbrella that's something that it's not really a hurdle it is something that I wish people sort of had a, a wider understanding of Everyone usually asks, what's the wisest piece of advice or what's the most BS piece of advice you've ever received? But what is the second wisest piece of advice that you've received that has stuck with you in your career? I don't know if it was more advice or if it was uh, just a, a response to a question that they weren't super willing or able to answer. So I don't remember what year it was. It was when Grant Morrison was writing Return of Bruce Wayne. When I read, when I first read it, I came up with this the most bizarre theory about how Batman was actually just a creation of dark side to destroy the universe. And I it was this whole thing the, the question was very short, was very streamlined, but I asked it during a panel. It was about the book, and I asked, I asked Grant Morrison. I'll, I'll never forget, the, they gave the most Grant Morrison answer when they said, if you keep thinking like that, soon you will be enlightened. And I, that can mean a million different things. Grant Moore, I mean, the most Grant Morrison answer I could have ever thought of. But but I, I sort of internalized it a little bit, and it sort of felt like sort of justification for my offbeat thought process that I have a lot during during writing. The way I've sort of interpreted it and internalized it is that if you just stick with your thoughts and the story that you want to tell, if you see that out to the end, it's going to work because it's your story. If you can see that out and just just go step by step and create the vision that you have, then you're safe. That's really all there is to it. And I think that made me feel more comfortable as a writer because at the time, I mean, every writer goes through this, but I wasn't confident in my writing. I didn't know like, oh, are people going to like it? Are they going to not like it? Are they going to enjoy it? And in the end, it, it kind of doesn't matter. It does, but it doesn't because you write because you want people to read it and you want people to enjoy it. But really, it's it's just about you expressing a story that you want to tell. And that's something that I've really sort of cherished through the years is that that quote-unquote advice does writing energize you or does it drain you it is very much both <laughs> a lot of my best story ideas and my best story fixes come when i'm running i go to the gym uh on the weekends mostly when when i finally got time for it what i found is that while i'm running if i can start thinking about a story that i'm writing I sort of forget that I'm running and I'm less tired doing it. And I sort of get into this groove. If I get in a, like a real, a real run, apologies for the pun, but if I get in a real run with my thought process and I'm starting, okay, yeah, like that's a, that's a great way to fix. Like, that's a great idea. Let's run with that. And like, I'll get excited and I'll get energized and I'll, I'll, I'll run longer than I intended to. And it's awesome. Yeah. There are times when uh, I get home after work and I'm tired and it can be very exhausting, but it's a push and pull. It's one of those push and pulls that's worth it either way. Burnout also is a factor too. I mean, you have to combat that as well too, but it sounds like you have your your ability to go to the gym to kind of balance yourself out in that respect. What else do you do to kind of reset your mind? I'll take breaks. I'll take, I'm a fan of the advice to once you write something, put it in a drawer for several weeks or a month or however long you think necessary so that you can come back to it with fresh eyes. And so I've always kind of got other side things that I'm working on. I sort of couple that with, I, I don't remember who said it or if, if it's just one of those things that everybody says, but just staring at your computer screen for 30 minutes, not writing anything, that counts as writing. Because you're not just staring at a blank page, you're just sort of doing mental gymnastics and you're not quite sure where to stick it yet. Like you're not sure where to end the routine and start writing it. If I'm stuck on something, I'll sort of put it away and I'll try to not think about it for a long time while I work on something else. And if that's not quite working, like I'll just sort of sit with it and I'll just sort of let it, let it stew, let, let me think about it for a long time and then maybe go for a run and then, and then it'll finally break through. The put it away thing, I believe, is Neil Gaiman. 
I think I've okay. heard him say that. I, I can yeah. I can't quite recall. That that sounds right. That sounds like Neil Gaiman. <laughs> that's not, yeah, that, that that's so Neil. You know, just yeah, like, yeah. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? That's hard. I listened to uh, a few of your episodes <laughs> with this question weeks ago, and even today, even, and I. It's a very difficult question. It's a great question. I don't know what the earliest is, but the example that I always kind of come back to is not just how powerful words can be, but how the same words can have different meanings, either over time or through context. And somebody who does a, a great job of that, that I've noticed, at least the most recent that I can think of, is Tom King. He's gotten some criticism for repetition. He's really good at just repeating the same word either over and over again on the same page or throughout the issue or throughout the run. And in the moment, it means something very specific. But then as the run continues, it sort of changes and it molds and it you sort of learn that words are powerful, but they're only powerful in what you grant them. So the, the word only means what you think it means or what you perceive it to mean. It's really cool in in a, a really strange way that words mean more, but you're the one who give words that power. The words mean nothing without you. And so it's up to you to use those words in specific ways, right? It's not the words themselves that are powerful. It's the writer or the person who uses them that really wields the intent and what those words in the end are trying to accomplish. The fact that you have this amazing team around you here and that you've, uh, you've talked about their amazing accomplishments in itself, and we've touched on the Kickstarter campaign as well. The story of your actual My Neighbor Necromancer, which is a great title, by the way. Let's, let's know a little bit more about why you wanted to write the story and what exactly is it all about? And is there going to be more than one issue? Uh, yeah, I, gosh, I hope there's going to be more than one issue. Yeah, so the, the book is written out currently as six issues. This is just for the first issue, and we're hoping people love it and that it's successful enough that we can keep it rolling and, and bring the full story uh, into people's hands. But the story itself is about this really cheery, this really upbeat girl who who sort of, she ends up chasing her pet lizard, Bibbits into the woods after the lizard is chased by this this malevolent looking raven. When she runs into the woods, she sort of discovers this old dilapidated cabin. And inside there is a, a very friendly necromancer. So if you think of wizards like Gandalf, who are who are very wise, and instead of doing, you know, light magic, he does, you know, magic with the dead. He raises the dead. But her presence there has sort of revealed his location. He's been hiding in this cabin for hundreds of years at this point. Uh, and now the forces of evil know his location. And now, because he's sort of been around the block a few too many times, so now she has to learn to raise the dead herself to prevent the forces of evil from maintaining um, what is the ultimate power, which is the literal hand of death itself. The first issue is 26 pages. We currently have six pages fully completed, and, and then also the cover. The first issue is 26 pages. The rest of them will likely be 26 pages as well. When I first started writing this book, I wasn't sure quite the direction I wanted to go with it. Um, I initially wanted the necromancer that she finds to actually be the villain. And I had this idea that she would have to steal a book from his cabin in order to fight it, fight back. But then I, I started re-watching some old, some old shows and rereading some old books, the idea that death is not always inherently evil and like things like necromancy and darker magic like that is really only as evil as its wielder really started to resonate with me. And so people like Neil Gaiman and Terry Pratchett have done a great job of personifying death and making them a friendly character, a helper even. And that's always something that I've, I've really loved as a concept, but I had never really seen with death magic. I went into this book with the idea that death is not your enemy. It's sort of the great motivator. It's something that's necessary for life in general. Like It's something that makes you want to do the most with the time you have. 
and then the loss of loved ones is very hard, but you still carry a piece of them with you in that way. They continue to inspire you to be a better person and to basically, you're still trying to make them proud even long after they're gone. And in that way, <laughs> and this is going to get into like very sort of cheesy territory, but like in a way we're all necromancers, right? Like we're all sort of wielding, wielding the power of the dead with us wherever we go. And that's sort of the, the undercurrent of the, is just sort of what, what we do every day with the concept of death and how that propels us um, in our own lives, I think. I always say when someone passes, it's as long as we remember them, whether it's an animal or, or a loved one, you know, as long as they're within our memories, then we'll never forget them and we'll always cherish our times with them. Yeah, it's it's exactly that. The four questions are for a documentary called Little Person Monks Media Giants. They are questions that I always ask uh, every creative person that I come across because they were four questions I was going to ask Stanley. That oh. didn't happen. So this is how this documentary came about. That's a great backstory for those questions, by the way. That's good. Well, I met him briefly at Motor City Comic Con a couple of many years back, but we were walking around, we were doing interviews, and I walked out the, the back going towards our car, and all of a sudden the side door bursts open, and four of the largest men that I've ever seen that were probably offensive linemen for the Detroit Lions, because they'll never go to a playoffs, burst through the door, and an elderly Stan Lee, or a spry Stan Lee at that time, I should say, uh, saw us, came out of the door with his trademark sunglasses, looked at us and said, thanks for coming out, true believers. And he was whisked out of, into his van. <laughs> I have a sort of a similar story. So I never met him, but I saw him uh, at San Diego Comic-Con. I had walked out of the building to talk with somebody on the phone, just as you described, four of the largest men I'd ever seen like burst through the door to walk outside and behind them comes Stan Lee and his trademark sunglasses. But rather than saying anything, he was just waiting to leave and there was nobody else around. I don't think anyone expected anyone else to be there. And he just kind of like, he just kind of leaned up against the wall and he kind of looked over at me and he just kind of nodded and they just kept sitting there. And I was, I was dumbfounded at the time. So I was like, Oh, oh no, he's there. But then he just got in his limo and drove away. So nice. Uh, I'm glad that someone else can corroborate the four largest men I've ever seen. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Yeah, Grant, Grant Morrison, they're just so weird. And that's always made me feel so comfortable in my own weirdness. I mean, you said I was allowed to use Grant Morrison again, but I, I don't feel comfortable double dipping on Grant Morrison. The other person, I am sure everybody's been inspired by Neil Gaiman at one point or another. But specifically for this book, his issue of Sandman on Death's Wings or in Death's Wings or something of that matter, and, and the personification of Death as this very kind, very helpful, but very necessary force it is something that I carry with me a lot. Death is something that it wants to help you as best it can, but it has a job to do, and it's going to do that job. So that's something that I, I try to remember while writing this book as well. Also, that episode of Sandman on, on Netflix when they did that, that was just really well done, I thought, too. Yeah, it was it was great. I love That's my favorite episode of the show. Yeah. It was perfect. I loved it. From a professional standpoint, you are a award-winning comic writer. You also have amazing series that you've written and created and have successfully funded on Kickstarter as well. And you're continuing to create many amazing works that we'll have to have you back on in the future to talk about as well, too. So please come back anytime. You're always welcome. Yes. <laughs> so professionally, you're successful in that regard. Do you consider yourself personally successful? Yeah, I, I think so. I would, I would say so. I married the love of my life last October. I work a job that I both enjoy and allows me the time to to do other things the fact that i'm both financially i'm both financially able and have the time to pursue my love and passion for writing and writing comics is something that a lot of people are not afforded and i i have to be grateful for that and i think if that's not success then then what is like there's there's always obviously the the money aspect like people who could be you know if i could be richer i always would be but 
I don't think that's really a great marker of success. That's something that you kind of might find along the way, but if you're happy and you get to do the things that you love, like there's, there should be no other marker of success than that. And I think in that regard, I've, I think I've succeeded. The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failure? Uh, I dwell on it and I just lay awake at night and don't sleep for days about it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I joke, but this seems backwards and counterintuitive to a lot of people, but I like to internalize a lot of my shortcomings and my failures. And I don't mean that I dwell on them, but I have a habit of letting them simmer until they've sort of the, the, the severity of them kind of dissipates. If it's something that I can't fix and it's out of my locus of control, the only thing I can do is learn from it. I just let it sit and I think about what I can learn for future instances and then that's it. I, you, you can't go back in the past. You can't fix what's been done. And so there's no there's no point in kicking yourself about it. If it's a failure that you can fix, then then just sort of let it, again, just let it sit, let it simmer, do some mental gymnastics and think about the best way to go about it. I know a lot of people prefer to talk about um, what happened and that's great. That's, that's super helpful. And I've, I have found that also helpful for me at times, but, but more often than not, like, I just, I just want to be alone for a bit. I just want to think about it and then think of the best path forward for me. Uh, And so I think that's, that's how I generally, on a very, very broad brush, how I usually deal with my my own personal shortcomings. The younger generation, oh, by the way, congratulations on getting married, too. Thank you. <laughs> the younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic creator or a creative person, or maybe you've inspired them on some path that you don't quite know of, but maybe you'll be the next Neil Gaiman that has inspired them to do what they want to do. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Oh, I had a great answer for this. I think the best thing to do is to put yourself on the page. And I don't just mean that in the the write what you know sense. I think you should write what you know and then what you also want to figure out. If there's something that you're struggling with personally, I would venture to say, try and put it in a story, um, put it in a story and then write it out. It's the same thing that a lot of people do when they write in their diary. Um, they're, they have a problem that they're trying to work out, um, whether it's personal or, or interpersonal. And then they write it out. And as they keep writing, they sort of, they sort of recontextualize it and they look at it from a different angle or, or, or what have you. And you can do that with large problems like when i wrote sweetheart it was very heavy handedly uh, about a lot of childhood fears that i had um fear uh, fears with diabetes uh, and there were things that i still wasn't quite sure how to grapple or, or how to, how to deal with and through the process of writing that story i figured it out and like i felt better about what i was what I, what i was dealing with and so i i think it's important to put what you know on the page as a groundwork for you to then deal with the stuff that you want to know better. And I think that's something that writing is unique in letting you, um, it, writing is unique in giving you that ability. If your life was a comic book or a film, what would its title be? And what would its soundtrack be? You said that this trips everybody up and I was laughing to myself because I've heard this question dozens of times at this point and I still don't have a good answer for it. No one does. Just I just know. <laughs> oh no, who is it? Somebody somebody said the monster has really run out. Oh, Hazan, yeah. yeah, yeah. Hazan, that's thank you. Yeah, yeah. David, yeah, yeah. David G. Hazan, yeah. The so monster good. has run out. Yeah, that was a great shot. I love it. He should make that's that awesome. as a t-shirt, seriously. Like, Yeah. Oh my God. I want to talk to him and write a book about it. I, don't, I want to make that a comic. Hit him up. <clears throat> he's 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 game. <laughs> yeah, maybe I don't know, I'm always so bad at titles. <laughs> my favorite, my favorite necromancer is a fluke in how great that title is. I'm always so bad at thinking of titles. 
Um, and so I'm just going to say the first, the thing that I keep thinking of, and it's, I don't know how good of a title it is. It's going to be hard to make a logo for, uh, but I think is maybe read, read the map or make one. And the soundtrack would be uh, this song that has a really cringy name, but is a, but it is an absolute banger. It's called my inner ninja. It's a song by a band called classified. But it's a it's a it's a fantastic song. But the whole theme of the song is learning to read the map before you hit the road. And so know what you're doing before you like know the rules, learn the rules before you break them. Hmm. Right. But if you find yourself in a situation where you, there's no guidance and you don't know what to do, like be your own guidance. Just just do just do. Right. So you either read the map and if there isn't one, make one. Well, Dylan, I do hate to say it, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you so much for having me again. Like I, I love the show. I'm glad that we can make this work. And I, I'm so excited to to continue the campaign. And I, I hope that I can come on again sometime. I hope I come on here for issue two mm. once issue one is fully funded. Hey, I'll have you on for whatever you decide to create. So <laughs> you got the link schedule anytime. I appreciate All right, you let's do it. taking time to do that. But before I let you go, where can we find you? How can we support you? Of course, where is the Kickstarter campaign and anything else you'd like to promote? So you can find me mostly on Twitter at Dill Gilbertson. Uh, I, that's my, that's my tag on, on most socials, Instagram, hi, blue sky, things like that. You can find the Kickstarter at uh, necrocomic.com. You can find me and more of my work at Dylan does uh, That's where I have samples of all my work. Some, some full comics are on there. Uh, and if you want more, you can just shoot me an email through the website and I'll be happy to get back to you. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others quite literally on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's T O W the word two, not the number two. The website's going through a revamp. So go to our YouTube channel because that is definitely a lot more updated than said website, which is youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. The podcast is back after 12 or so years. So you're going to see this interview and hundreds of thousands of more on twogeekstalking.podbean.com or just search for Two Geeks Talking wherever you get your podcasts and it will be there. And as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.